Welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Leslie Johnson, a member of the City Club's Board of Governors. For over 100 years, City Club of Portland is where civic-minded people come together to make Portland and Oregon a better place for everyone to live, work, and explore. We're gathered here at the Sentinel Hotel, along with all of you listening on OPB or viewing on Open Signal or YouTube. The generous support of City Club's corporate and media partners enables us to put on the state's best civic programs week after week. Our media partner is Oregon Business Magazine, and our current Friday Forum sponsors are Family Care Health and Northwest Natural. Please show your appreciation for all of them. Now on to today's program. The frequent and ongoing conflicts between police and communities of color have scarred countless families, neighborhoods, and cities across the country and here in Oregon. Today we'll hear one creative way local law enforcement is trying to help the Portland community heal and connect. Theater group August Wilson Red Door Project has been doing continuous performances of the new Black Fest, Hands Up, Seven Playwrights, Seven Testaments. The show has ignited a conversation on racial justice that resonates deeply with many Portlanders, including the Portland Police Department. Joining us today is Kevin Jones, co-founder and CEO of the August Wilson Red Door Project. It was organized to change the racial ecology of Portland through the arts. He is a theater director and actor, as well as a communications consultant, and he is the director of the company's production of Hands Up. With him is Captain Robert Day, the head of the Portland Police Training Division. Officer Day has been with the Portland Police Department over 27 years. His division has formed a unique partnership with Kevin and his team. The division is responsible for training the entire department throughout the course of the year. Moderating today's conversation is D. May Roberts, executive producer of Media Rights, a nonprofit that does multi multicultural projects in media and theater. She is a two-time Peabody award-winning award -winning radio producer, a writer, and a theater professional. Please welcome our speakers. For those of you listening on OPB, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Dime Roberts, executive producer of Media Rights and Theater Diaspora. Today we're exploring the topic, Streets to Stage, How Law Enforcement is Learning from Theater. With me are panelists Kevin Jones, artistic director and co-founder of the August Wilson Red Door Project, and Captain Robert Day, director of training, Portland Police Bureau. Welcome to the City Club of Portland. <laughs> Thank you. So Kevin and Bob, we're, let's start off with some background about the racial equity work that you're both doing. Uh, Kevin, if you want to start and just uh, tell us a little bit about how you started Red Door. How long ago did you start Red Door Project and how has it grown since that time? Okay. Oh, good. You can't hear me. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, I want to say first that Bob, this is the first time we're we're coming out. Actually, we we're this is we've not done this publicly before. Which is um, so the Red Door Project started about six years ago. Um, it, it was a, an idea that came out of a work that we noticed happening uh, through the work of August Wilson's uh, play, actually at that time it was the Radio Golf, and um, that show ignited a huge uh, community response. It was a lot, it's the plays about gentrification and um, we noticed that the people that were coming were into gentrification, they were experiencing gentrification, they were feeling it, and so it, it actually created a lot of conversation. And we realized that theater does that, that's what theater does. And um, so we had in several shows after that, and we decided that we wanted to, we didn't want this just to be uh, the flavor of the year, uh, we wanted to make sure that theater uh, found a foothold within the Portland community where we could, in fact, um, encourage theaters to produce and uh, present work that's written for, by, and with people of color. And um, so that's what we've been doing. And from that, we developed a consulting group called the Portland Equity for the Arts Consortium. We worked with six theaters over the course of six months, three hours a month. 
uh, working with them, helping them understand what it means to make their community, their, their theaters, their home more welcoming to people who are different from them. Um, we also produce the August Wilson Monologue Competition, which is a program that's focused on high school students, teaching them the monologues of August Wilson, and um, subsequently taking three of them at first, now two of them to New York to compete in the national competition. So that's a little bit about us. Well, uh your play, Hands Up, Seven Playwrights and Seven Test Seven Playwrights, Seven Testaments, uh, has been seen by more than 6,000 Portlanders. Yes. And uh, you've toured it around Oregon. I was wondering, um, you've had also very good response from local funders as well. Uh, why do you think it has struck such a chord, especially here in Portland? Great. Um, so just to give you some history about Hands Up, um, we decided that we weren't going to do the monologue competition one year, and we wanted to do something that aligned with our mission, that is producing work and theater that uh, is focused on changing the racial ecology of Portland, which is our mission. And um, my production assistant had, um, I had a, um, this play that was sent to me from New York. It was sitting on my desk, and my production assistant said, Kevin, what is this play? And I said, it's a play, it's hands up. Um, it's about six at that time, six black folks who were upset with the police. And I kind of said it in that sort of cavalier way, dismissive almost. And she said, do you mind if I read it? And she read it and she came back and she said, we should do this play. And I said, um, well, you know, we already have a lot of uh, reaction and uh, anger and resentment coming from, the, from all sides of the community. I really need to think about it. And we talked about what we would actually, how would we position it? And I said that, well, we need to get a value proposition. Um, I'm from the for-profit world and was involved in marketing for a long time, and I've always thought um, uh, that theater is not immune to the need for value proposition. In other words, what is the relationship that the theater has with the community? What is it that the, this particular play, this particular product, what is the deal that it's making with the community? If you don't know that, then you it really, the theater is just producing what it emotionally is connected to. It is not necessarily making it, creating a relationship with the community. So um, in thinking about it, we realized that this was a play that um, offered an opportunity for healing. That we could, by seeing it, by experiencing it, by in facilitating the talkbacks and, and structuring it in such a way, that not only the African American community could heal from this, but also the mainstream white community could heal from this. From seeing the shows, because the truth is a lot of folks don't even know that this kind of thing happens to African Americans on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Um, and the other side of it is that a lot of black folks, when th they are profiled or stopped by the police, they keep it to themselves. They don't share it with other people. They don't share it even like maybe with their family members, but they don't go around and say, hey man, you know what happened to me? I got stopped by the police and blah, blah, blah. So this was an opportunity for folks to, to come out and share their experience and talk about it. Um, and through that, we believe that a lot of healing can happen. And I think this is a momentous moment for both you and Bob to be here to be able to talk about this. Uh, Bob, I, let's find out more background about the racial equity work that you're doing in the police department. Well, I want to thank City Club for having us. And uh, five years ago, you told me I'd be sitting on the stage with Kevin. I tell you, you're crazy. <laughs> I'm still not exactly certain that it's a good sure. idea right now. But um, uh, no, actually, it's really been an amazing, uh, amazing journey and uh, both personally and professionally for me. Um, I've been with the police department, like I said, over 27 years, and just my own bias, I'm unapologetically proud uh, member of the Portland Police Bureau. I'm a, I'm a cop's cop, you would say, in, a, in the most traditional way, and, uh, and I'm proud of that. But I've also learned uh, a few things over the years um, that's really challenged me and is in continuing uh, on this journey, as I said, both personally and professionally. And some of that goes back to, um, you know, really, Ferguson uh, was sort of a benchmark event for this nation, history uh, and uh, law enforcement in so many ways, and the narrative that's come out of that. And I remember sitting with my son uh, three or four years ago in, in 2014, and uh, we're watching the news, and we're watching all of the violence that's occurring post-Ferguson, uh, and, and Sam looks at me, and he says, Dad, how come when you guys shoot a white guy, that this doesn't happen? 
and I thought, you know, I have an opportunity here. Right? I mean, I'm having an impact. I'm raising the next generation of white male young man, 14, 13 year old boy. And I could have a more traditional response that I would have probably given, you know, maybe years earlier of, well, you know, it's just a bunch of thugs or criminals or whatever the case may be, even though the screen is filled with African Americans uh, participating in, in this activity. And I said, you know, Sam, I said, this is bigger than just Darren Wilson and Michael Brown. I said, you know, let's talk about really what's, what's more at stake here. And, you know, we don't agree with this behavior. We don't support this. But, um, you know, this is about a, a prejudice and a history of racism around a lot of things besides law enforcement. But, you know, law enforcement has to own part of that. And that was, you know, sort of my own personal experience. And then professionally, um, several years ago, somebody handed me um, uh, Dr. King's letters from the Birmingham jail. And uh, I'm not necessarily proud of the fact, but I'd really never read or considered anything written by Dr. King. I knew who he was, obviously, and considered he's probably a pretty good guy. But I was uh, just blown away at the um, power in his writings. And one of the things that challenged me was he talks very candidly in those letters about his frustration with sort of the uh, you know middle class average white folks that are just uh, telling him to be patient and hang in there. You know, they're good people, but uh, he even comes out and talks about how, you know, he's not really worried about the KKK and Bull Connor and all these other really outspoken critics. It's his frustration is with that sort of non-involved voice. And, uh, and it occurred to me that that was really me. You know, I'm a good guy. I've got a wonderful family. I go to church. I'm a good person. I like people. I, I think I'm generally a good person. But it challenged me to uh, really understand a few things, and that is, you know, one, and I'm not responsible for all of the ills that have happened at the hands of law enforcement in the last 400 years of this country. Um, but, uh, but two, um, as a white male, particularly a white male law enforcement executive, I have a great deal of access granted to me and privilege granted to me that, um, you know, once again, it's not my fault, but it's something that I need to be aware of and, and understand. And those two things led me to a third point, which is I have a responsibility. And I have responsibility not only as an individual, but I have responsibility as a law enforcement executive to begin to have these conversations within the culture that I have served and worked and loved and am passionate about. So that's what's brought me to this relationship with Red Door. Well, we want to talk more about that journey, definitely. Uh, if you're just joining us now on OPB, this is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Dime Roberts, executive producer of Media Rights and Theater Diaspora. Today's topic, Streets to Stage, How Law Enforcement is Learning from Theater, with panelist Kevin Jones, artistic director and co-founder of the August Wilson Red Door Project, and Captain Robert Day, director of training of the Portland Police Bureau. So what are some, Bob, what are some of the important things that you've learned with the racial equity work within the police department that you're doing? Well, it's hard work. Um, you know, that's what I've learned. It's really hard work. And it's I, I speak candidly with, uh, with our members and publicly, obviously, here is very public in the sense that I think um, the challenges uh, facing law enforcement in the 21st century um, you know, can really be narrowed down to things that we're all pretty familiar with, you know, the, the, certainly around mental health, certainly around of our communities that are living outside. And then, um, you know, the historical uh, understanding and the ongoing challenges we face in terms of our intersection with people of color. And so um, that has led me to have a more, uh, a more vocal presence on this topic. Um, but realizing that, you know, organizationally, we have not a good, done a good job in, in law enforcement um, around it in terms of uh, engaging and actually asking our members to join us on this journey. Historically, most of the training and most of the education around this topic is come into a room because you're ordered to sit down, get your three hours of training. By the way, if you're a white straight male, it's all your fault and get up and leave. And that's just a very candid expression of a lot of the training we've had over the years. That hasn't resonated well with our membership as I don't think it would resonate with many. Um, combine that with the national narrative and even the local narrative. I mean, if you really take a challenge yourself and look at the way that um, we speak of the police and we uh, identify the police in articles, especially when we have these tragedies that occur, um, and, and uh, it's, it's very disparaging at times. It's, you know, it's highly critical, and I'm open to the criticism. That's something that 
Um, we are given a tremendous amount of authority and responsibility, and I think accountability should be very, very high in policing. But that narrative has done tremendous harm in the police culture um, in many ways. It's reduced the hiring. It's, uh, people are not uh, you know, wanting to participate in policing. It's really shut down a lot of the initiative uh, among police officers, and it's also, I think, furthered, uh, hindered the ability to move forward on this topic because of the, of the uh, constant you know, criticism, which once again, I'm not saying there isn't room for this. I'm all involved in this work because I believe there's a huge need for change and a huge need for education and responsibility. But it's a challenge to fight against both the historical piece. And, and don't get me wrong, I understand that you know, the police have the voice, that so we have the platform, I get that. You know, and, and we've been around for a long, long time and we're gonna be around for a long, long time. So I'm not, this isn't a woe is me kind of a spiel. Um, I understand that uh, our, our role and our influence, but I'm also trying to be a voice for that group. Well, let's talk about how in, you and Kevin have come together now um, and built this relationship. My understanding, Kevin, is that uh, Alonzo Chadwick, one of the actors in Hands Up, um, met with police officer Mike Krebs uh, about a year ago, and they developed a, a relationship. And is that how you were brought in, Bob, with, within that relationship? Or Kevin, do you want to speak to that with Alonzo? Um, yeah, and so I just before, I just want to say that uh, part of our strategy around uh, developing audiences was to partner with community-based organizations in Portland. So it's not an accident that we not only were able to connect with the police, but were welcoming and excited about it um, as well. Um, but we did uh, reach out to several community-based organizations that helped us um, um, from marketing, Know Your City was working with us, and uh, we reached out to the Oregon Humanities, the YWCA, um, Meyer Memorial Trust, um, several different organizations. I'm not going to mention them all, probably, and but it was it was it was in our DNA to reach out to community-based organizations and to partner with them, um, not just to say, "Hey, come to our show." but also to strategize, to think about how we can work together to make to further the mission. Um, yes, so um, we, were, we did a show at uh, Artist Repertory Theater, and I think it was a show that was sponsored by the Meyer Memorial Trust, and uh, Mike Krebs, who was a police officer, came to the show. Um, he had a, beforehand had, him and I had met and had a cup of coffee before he'd even come to the show. We actually talked for about two hours at, in a coffee shop downtown, and and I was really moved by the conversation. I had never had a conversation with a police officer before. I'd never spent any time having a social uh, interaction with a police officer. I was scared to death of them, and um, Mike was the first uh, police officer who was doing something other than just being cordial. You know, he was actually being warm and sincere and forthcoming and vulnerable. And, um, you know, I mean, Mike is, uh, as Bob has told me, is like my, uh, Mike Krebs is a different breed. Don't expect me to be like that. <laughs> but <clears throat> but uh, he actually is, though. Um, but anyway, um, so he said he would come to the show, and he did. And he didn't come in uniform. He stood up afterwards, and he talked. He shared his experience, and uh, I was touched. And then at, at the end of the show, he reached out to Alonzo, and said uh, they had a conversation about, uh, um, uh, I think what Mike was assuming was that because Alonzo is such a good actor, um, he, he believed that, Alon that this was actually happening to Alonzo, this, that what he was portraying and what he was saying in the monologue was actually had happened. Truth of the matter is it very close to being uh, actual. Anyway, Mike offered to take him out for a cup of coffee. They went for a cup of coffee. They talked. They, they connected. Uh, he, Mike brought a, a, a recruit with him. Um, and so the relationship um, sparked off from there. Alonzo called me and said, uh, you know, hey, listen, I'm meeting with this cop. You know, I hope it's okay. I mean, you know, I'm, we seem to be having a good conversation. It's all right. I said, yeah, it's great, man. Just keep doing it. I'm glad you let me know. And I think they even went out to a cup, spoke at some schools together. And uh, it's been a great, great. And then Mike from that said, you know what, uh, we need to move forward on this. And he said, I'd, I'd like you to meet uh, Captain Day at the, the training division. And so me and, and uh, my wife and co-founder, Leslie, 
we went and met with Bob and a couple of other police officers. And I remember Mike, the first thing he said was, okay, so look, if you're gonna say anything about racism or give, start, start with this whole institutional racism thing, if you talk to our guys about that, you have lost us, man. You just, you, you will not make any kind of connection there. So just get that out of your head. And um, do you remember that? Yeah. Okay. I think I'm the one that said that, not Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you were. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I said to Bob, I said, well, you know, actually, you know, I mean, I, what I really, and it was a thought that just came to me at the, at the moment was, um, I'd love to tell your story. I'd love to do monologues that focused on the police officers. Um, and Bob got excited about that, and I got excited about that, and everybody in the room got excited about that. And um, I think the relationship started from there. And from my view of the room, um, I felt that and I think a lot of it had to do with all the work that we've been doing with Hands Up, that um, you know, the, 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 the boundary, the wall had been dropped for me. I started to understand that people are people, and we are in a role, and we, being in that role, we are assigned certain tasks and certain duties, and sometimes we don't, other people that are outside of that don't like that, and the police officers have a very tough role because there's nobody in this room that would say, well, I just wish all the cops would go away. Uh, they protect us, that's their job. They're charged with protecting us and holding a very hard and strong boundary. And I sp speak a lot about that in, in the talk back and hands up that, you know, we think of uh, at the Red Door, we think of things as a system. And we think that all, everyone, everything is a system, and especially this culture. And systems do three things. They protect themselves, they expand, and they evolve. But the first thing they do is they protect. And Portland is built on a white utopia. It has values, beliefs, and behaviors that are based on a white supremacist perspective. And so police officers, without knowing it, are gonna protect whatever is the mainstream culture without uh, concern for the politics of it, the value of it, or whatever. And they do a good job. They try to do a good job of it, and they make mistakes. Holding a boundary is, is uh, it, you can't do it perfectly. But anyway, when sitting down with, uh, with Bob, I connected with a man who, had, who was showing his humanity. And th the way he did that was by saying to me straight up, hey, you, you start talking that racism stuff, you've lost us. And to me, that was like an opportunity in. That was a way in. That was a, an opportunity to connect one human being to another. And I could certainly share my fears and anxieties and concerns about talking to the police officers as well. But from that, um, we decided that uh, we wanted to bring hands up to the police division. But before that, I think, Bob, you had to come see the show, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mike uh, Krebs had asked me to come see the show, and I told him, hell no, I wasn't going to the show. Um, and then I mentioned something offhand to my lovely bride of 21 years, and she said, let's go do that. So we went to the show. and. Uh, uh, we were at the Hollywood Theater, and um, there's no way in the world I was going to get up and identify myself as a police officer, and um, I didn't. And I left there, and we processed on the way home, and uh, I told her, I said, that wasn't uh, a particularly pleasant experience. And, um, uh, but as time went on, and we circled back with Kevin and Leslie, and we began to develop a relationship, and once again, just being comfortable sort of sitting with this uh, uneasiness, sitting with this uncomfortableness. Uh, I'm not telling you that this is necessarily fun work for me. I can tell you my life is richer because of it. Um, my world is broader. Uh, my relationships are deeper, and I'm, I'm blessed. But there are many, many times where, uh, you know, just going home to suburbia and kind of going back to, to uh, the way that it is or was is, uh, you know, something that I have considered, but we embarked on this journey, and what sucked me into this thing was uh, Kevin saying, hey, let's have a voice for the police, and, um, and that's where it really piqued my interest, but to do that, we also have to learn. The police have to change and, and adapt and be open, too. I've been to the show half a dozen times now. I tell the actors I could step in for them if they ever go down while I'm there, but, uh, you know, uh, and I don't, I'm frankly, I don't like it a whole lot each time I go, but I learn every time I go, and I'm using quotes from the show now in my discussions with, uh, with officers, and, um, and uh, it's sort of inspired me to, you know, engage in these conversations at another level. We've brought uh, friends of ours now. I've gone, you know, on my own time, obviously, and brought uh, relationships that we have. So 
um, it's become a, a powerful voice and, uh, and we can speak to how it connected with the training division and uh, you know, talk about that a little bit if you'd like. Yes, let's, let's do that. Uh, it, just uh, a reminder that you are listening to OPB. This is City Club of Portland's Friday Forum. I'm Dee Mae Roberts, executive producer of Media Rights and Theater Diaspora. Our topic is Streets to Stage, How Law Enforcement is Learning from Theater. And our panelists are Kevin Jones, artistic director and co-founder of the August Wilson Red Door Project, and Captain Robert Day, director of training of the Portland Police Bureau. Well, I, I'm also interested in this collaboration that you're doing, that uh, a new play. Now, this is, to me, is this a new venture for you, Bob? Oh, yeah, this is all new. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we, we, Kevin and I met in the fall of last year, and we were talking about this, and I said, well, you know, we'll have a show, and we'll get some cops there, and I thought that'd be easy enough. Um, so we lined up a time and said, okay, and I went, and I've been around a long time. I know a lot of people, so I'm like, hey, we're doing this show. Why don't you come? And it was a resounding, no, we're not coming. And uh, so that was kind of awkward to go back to Kevin and say, hey, I don't really, uh, I can't pull this off. And, um, and Kevin shared, you know, the actors necessarily weren't thrilled about doing a show for a bunch of cops, so I think we both realized we had some work ahead of us. And um, so I took my supervisory team out to coffee, because we tend to do that once in a while at Starbucks, and uh, I just said, what's the deal? You know, and I got some really hard, direct feedback about where these tenured senior law enforcement supervisors were on this issue. And I was pretty discouraged. It was pretty hard, but I appreciated their candor and their trust in me. So I went back to the office, kind of sitting in my office, sort of hanging my head, and uh, two of the sergeants came in about an hour later, and they said, why don't we invite them into our house to do like a community academy? And some of you in this room maybe have participated, but you know, they'll come and they'll spend a day at the training division, all the actors and everyone, and, um, and then you know, we'll get to be able to show them and tell them what we do. And I said, okay, as long as you, know, you agree to have some conversation during the day. And, um, and so we got together, and to the credit of the actors and the cast, uh, they were much more uh, vulnerable, much more engaging than the police officers were. They were, um, you know, reserved, and, uh, but still, I think at the end of the day, it was positive. Uh, it was encouraging to both sides. And then afterwards, Kevin and I got back together, and I said, uh, ironically, we did that training on Martin Luther King Day in January of this year. And then on, uh, in, on March 10th of this year, uh, we held a performance at the training division only for people who had participated in the training day. We had about 30 officers support us in the training day. I didn't order anybody to be there. I didn't, you know, it wasn't a twist their arm. I just said, hey, we're doing this. And Kevin and I are like, if we get five cops there, that'll be a win. And we had over 20 police officers show up. And a lot of them were, you know, they came to our house. They listened to us. We'll go and we'll listen to them. And... Um, and that was a lot more unfiltered. In fact, I was scared to death when I walked in and saw the set actually set up in the training division. I thought, holy mackerel, what have I gotten myself into actually inviting these seasoned, tenured officers to this program. And then afterwards, we sat in a room for about 90 minutes and had you know, some of the most candid conversations that uh, we've ever had, um, really powerful. Uh, once again, this isn't a, a kumbaya. We all walk out the door holding hands in agreement, marching forward, but um, it has really drawn us to another level where now officers um, are engaging with Kevin and Leslie. We're talking about, you know, going forward on, you know, trying to create monologues for police. Um, you know, I've had officers approach me and say, you know, it's the first time in 25 years we've been able to talk about our feelings with communities of color. You know, um, I've had officers come up and say, this gives me hope that we're having this conversation. Um, and like I said, I mean, I, I've been to the play half a dozen times now, and it's hard to see. If you're a cop, it's a hard, play to see and watch, and, um, and I certainly don't agree with everything in it, but that's not what we're striving for. We're not striving for agreement here. We're striving for an understanding and, uh, you know, an opportunity to learn and develop so that my passion is when these intersections occur, because they will continue, the police are not going away, there will continue to be um, interactions with the community. It's an expectation. When it happens, then I want to have our officers as prepared as possible with as many tools and resources as possible. That's understanding, history, knowledge, empathy, whatever uh, we can come to. And Kevin and Leslie have been a great guide for that. Well, Kevin, the discussions are very healing and they're an important part of Hands Up. How are you uh, developing this new work from the police perspective and what do you hope to do with that? 
Well, we're in a very early place with the uh, development of the play. We're identifying writers, and so if any of you are writers, by the way, if you've written story or narrative, um, let us know. We're also identifying police officers who are willing and able to tell their story. I just gotta say that, you know, uh, you haven't really lived until you've spent some time with a cop and listen, let them tell you their story. I mean, seriously, I mean, they have some stories to tell you. It gives you a completely different perspective. And I'm talking as, as someone who has been stopped and pulled out of a car, yanked out of a car, pulled out of a bathroom, thrown to the ground, handcuffed, put a gun to my head. I mean, over the course of my life from the time I was 14 years old, I'm scared to death. I see a cop. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people in the room are, you look at a cop in your windshield and your, your heart pounds, right? Um, with all of that, sitting down with a police, some of these police officers and just having a conversation about a day in the life or what they think about or what, they are, what their hopes are for the future or what they want out of their life is a very powerful experience. Um, and I'm not saying that to be condescending or to make sure I don't get any tickets or have somebody to call when I need to, Bob. I mean, <laughs> just, um, anyway. So what we noticed in that, that training day that Bob talked about, I'm gonna go back to your question in just one second, D-Mate, so I haven't forgot it, but I just wanna fill in a little piece here is that, first of all, we did the, the show in this place called Scenario Village. Now, the first time we were introduced at the Scenario Village, it was where two officers were, um, I think it was some sort of certification for AR uh, automatic rifle training. So they were up on this like bridge and there was this guy down, that, that, so it's like a, a movie studio, so there's buildings and apartments and houses and streets and all this stuff. And they were trying to, you know, stop this guy from going into this house who could do damage, right? So they had to shoot him. They had to kill him. So we were watching this. Me and Leslie were watching this. And it was like, okay, so let's do the show here. <laughs> so that's where we did it. We did it in that in the Scenario Village, um, which was kind of eerie and ironic. Um, and we had the actors coming out from apart from the different buildings and so on and so forth. So it was great. Um, and. The thing that really touched me about that experience was the culmination of actors who are trained to embody the lives and the emotions and feelings of another, sitting and talking to people who are really invested in staying the same, and being the same emotionally, and shut down in some ways because police officers are somewhat shut down because it's a hard life and they go through a lot of trauma and the truth of the matter is I don't think they always get opportunities to really work through that trauma. So we had this talk back afterwards that Bob, that Bob talked about where we got actors who are, we're conditioned to sort of be emotional and be vulnerable and be open with, with police officers who have no access to that at all for the most part. And we were able to talk we were able to have a conversation. We didn't agree, as Bob said, we didn't agree on everything. Um, and we fought about some things, but we stayed in the room. And you know, we didn't fight, we didn't argue, and we all walked away from that wanting to do it again. So that was really amazing for, for us. And yeah, so as far as the, the, what we're calling it is cop out, and um, it's, uh, what we're doing is we're, because we don't have police officers that are playwrights. Um, we are identifying um, people who don't have a whole lot of stuff about cops who can find their way into being willing to sit with them and tell their, and, and tell their story. Uh, we're identifying those writers and then connecting them with police officers who are willing to tell their story. And that's where we are right now with the DMA. Well, we're going to take a moment. We could keep talking um, and, okay. and you know, all day, and okay. I love this conversation. We're going to take a moment, though, to go to the audience for some additional questions. And um, if you've written a question on an index card, hold it high for the staff to collect. Anybody have a question? I'll read at least one index card question. Uh, we invite City Club members to ask their questions first on, at the microphone. 
and asking questions at the Friday Forum microphone is a benefit of City Club membership, and membership is open to everyone. So let's start off with the first question. There's a long line already. Uh, please identify yourself as a City Club member, and you can ask one question in less than 30 seconds. Okay, I'm Arnie Perlstein, a member of the City Club. I find this astonishing in a very positive way, especially in a time of national despair over many things. But I'm wondering, have you reached out to Van Jones or someone like him to get this word out to the entire United States? Because he would be exactly, I think, the kind of person who would help you sort of make this go viral. Can I say something? So um, we're trying to avoid that whole concept of viralness. Um, I just, and, and, and you know, I, uh, when we first made the decision to put the show on, we did not give press passes to the show um, because we didn't want the press to spin this into some sort of um, sociological um, race narrative that, is, that goes beyond just people trying to get along, trying to figure it out. Um, we had one um, organization, News from the News, uh, came and, and we were called from that moment on uh, a movement, a Black Lives Matter movement. And you know what bugs me about the Black Lives Matter movement when it comes from people from the media? They don't know what Black Lives Matter is. So it becomes code for angry black people who are focused on themselves, who are selfish, who don't care about anybody but themselves, who don't give, a, who don't care about white folks. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just saying that uh, um, viralness is, uh, is problematic, and at the same time, we need to go viral. And at the same time, we do need, this is the thing that we want to make sure gets out into the, into the ethos, into, our, into the zeitgeist. We, we just need to be very thoughtful and very careful. And frankly, we need money is what we need. We don't need viralness. We need good thinkers and we need people with money who can support us because we're putting a lot of time and hundreds of hours of unpaid hours are being spent right now by everyone, including Bob, uh, to make this happen. And what we need is support. Um, the, the, what I've noticed is that people want to talk about how great this is um, and how it makes them feel, makes them feel good. And yet, when it comes to actually taking the actions and getting involved, this is a relationship that has been going on for over a year. It's taken a year before we've been able to get to a place where we are right now. So. Just don't think it's gonna just take a bunch of like people just knowing about it. It's gonna take some action. It takes money. And I don't like asking for money, but that's, that's the deal. So thank you. And, and for me, I mean, I have a vision that uh, this needs to go viral, I understand, uh, but I'm, I'm actually very supportive where Kevin's at. But you know, there's 18,000 police agencies in this country. Um, you don't have to do anything but turn on the news or look at the internet, and I'm sure there'll be an article tonight um, about this topic and um, you know I'm passionate about equipping our officers it's our responsibility um, to have that understanding to have that training and to have that um, uh, ability to manage these challenging situations and so I don't think we've done a good job of that around this topic but it has been hijacked so much over the years and there's been so much harm done I want to proceed carefully um, and, and I want to let the officers express themselves in a way that's not always really comfortable, not really polished, but I think that's part of the healing process for them as well. Can we take another question? And uh, remember to identify yourself as a City Club member and ask a question in less than 30 seconds. Kristen Malone, I'm a City Club member. I'm wondering with the increased uh, attention and understanding of the issues affecting race and policing over the past five years, what changes have been made to the Portland Police's uh, recruitment and training? Well, a couple things. One, you know, recruitment-wise, we're much more intentional. You might be aware just in the last year, uh, we've developed a relationship with John Jay College back in the East Coast. Uh, they have a massive criminal justice program, has a high percentage of uh, communities or people of color, and so that's been a real intentional effort. I don't have the numbers in front of me from the personnel division, but um, I know that that's been positive. In terms of a training standpoint, you know, we uh, obviously, Police Bureau has a racial equity plan. We follow that with the, in line with the city. But, um, you know, last year we just completed a couple of years of training around the history of race in Portland, just doing, a, you know, literally an educational piece. 
Um, I have uh, volunteered to be the lead instructor for implicit bias training, which we'll be doing next spring, uh, delivering to all members of the organization. Um, you know, these are baby steps. Uh, I understand the sense of urgency on the part of the community and the desire to see significant movement in broad ways. Um, but, you know, as I've told Kevin, uh, and I don't say this lightly, and it is sarcastic, but, uh, you know, the police have the ability to just sort of wait you out. You know, if they don't want to do something, they're not going anywhere. I've worked for 12 chiefs and five mayors. So, I mean, you know, it's just a matter of just waiting. So if you want that buy-in and you really want that change, we have to take these steps, small steps, but steps moving forward nonetheless. So, you know, um, in the, from the training standpoint, and then on top of all that is the work that Kevin and Leslie are doing. We could spend the next day talking about how proud I am of the men and women that are stepping up alongside of me. This isn't the Bob Day Show by any means and are partnering with us to, you know, maybe take this to the next level. If this thing goes and you have hands up and you have, you know, cop out or hands up 2.0, whatever we call it, and we play those juxtapose in police departments and agencies across the country and the conversation that would stem from that, I think would be fascinating. Well, we, ha we have a short question here. Um, uh, are there any black officers involved in the production that uh, is developing here? Yeah, yes, we, yes okay. there are. Um, as far as Portland, we have African-American um, police officers that I'm meeting with. As a matter of fact, I got a phone call from one uh, couple of, well, last week, um, met with him <laughs> 11 o'clock at night. Uh, he was on duty, and I met with him in a, in a bar. Um, and we spent about two and a half hours together talking about how difficult it is for him as an African-American police officer to ne negotiate the, the territory of feeling vilified by people in the public, the general public, and when he takes his uniform off, being called the N-word when he is walking around and trying to park his car. So yes, there's, um, yeah, we have a biracial um, police officer whose father uh, is black and won't speak to him because he's a cop and how painful that is for him because he loves his dad and wants to connect with him and he can't talk with anyone within the police department about it. So, yes, yes. Many stories. Many uh, stories. We want to take one last question and remember to identify yourself, city club member, 30 seconds or less. Thank you. My name is Edward Hershey. I'm a city club member. As part of my training after I joined as a citizen member of the Independent Review Board here in Portland, I did a ride along, a shift with two Portland police officers. I can tell you that when that squad car passed 82nd Avenue, it was as if a switch had been thrown. And what was perceived one way in one part of Portland was suddenly perceived in an entirely different context in, that, in the East County area. Do you have a, a, a I question? thought about that when Mayor Wheeler was here in March in the state of the city address and said that if you were a person of color, you had seven times more likely chance of being stopped and ticketed for jaywalking in Portland than if you were a, a Caucasian. Captain Day, is this indicative of a real problem and what do we do about it? Are you asking Bob Day? Okay, yeah. all right. That's not a loaded question at all, Ed. I appreciate it. Um, the shorter answer is there's a problem. But that's the short answer. I mean, that's just reality. And a lot of my peers don't want to hear it. I'll quote a line from Hands Up, you know, if, if, uh, if racial profiling does not exist, then there's a whole lot of African-American men that need mental health counseling because they're believing something that isn't real. Um, so that's that experience that's happening out there, that real lived experience. And even though I myself will sit here and tell you that I've never stopped anybody based upon the color of their skin or taken enforcement action based on the color of their skin, I've also learned that I'm not so naive to realize that I do have a bias and I do have a prejudice that could be influencing and is influencing those decision making. And that's difficult for the police to hear and understand and I, and I know why, because as Kevin said, we're we're trained to stay in the center, to stay in the middle. And that's very, um, that's, a, that's a noble calling and I think we do it very, very well. But those biases and those prejudices cannot help 
but enter into the interaction that happens. I mean, we're human beings. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me. I'm not going to argue stops data and, you know, disproportionate uh, numbers in the criminal justice system. We know that they're, they're out there, they're real. Um, uh, but the reality is, uh, and I appreciate what Kevin had said earlier, you know, the men and women are, are asked to do uh, what I believe is an impossible job at an impossible time right now. And that's not an excuse. We chose to do it. I was at the basic academy down in Salem the other day, and I go to the graduations regularly to see all these young people raise their hands, and they all say, pick me, I'm in, I'll do it, no matter what, I'm all in. And I go down there, because I stood down there 27 plus years ago and said the same thing. So if I don't like it, and I don't like the heat, I can get out and do something else. But Yes, Ed, I do believe that it's a challenge that, that, our, uh, that our culture is facing, and um, once again, it's, it's a lot of heavy, hard work. Well, uh, we actually can take a couple more questions if people want to, co city club members want to come up to the mic. Um, this is from a Twitter user. How do you create more spaces for police and the black community to interact? You want to take that, Bob or Kevin? Any suggestions for creating more opportunities for the city and um, the p uh, black community and police to interact? Well, I mean, I, yeah, I'm sure there's plenty. I just want to recognize that there are lots of things already happening um, where police officers are, are reaching out to the, in the community. I know they have uh, gone out to Jefferson High School and had a breakfast with the African-American uh, boys there and at SEI. Leslie and I, we were at, um, where were we, in Aloha, um, in a coffee shop, and there were four police officers just sitting drinking coffee, and they in, uh, invited us to have coffee, and apparently that's been happening um, periodically in, in different uh, parts of the city and, and county. Um, so I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm at a place in my life where I'm not out and about that much, so I don't really know, but I also, I, like I say, I just want to recognize that you know, it's up to us too. You know, we do have to be willing to drop our, you know, our baggage and our fears and our preconceived ideas and our biases. You know, we're all, we're talking about cops dropping their biases, but we have to also realize that we have biases on the other side as well, and have to be dropped and or at least acknowledge that you have them. So, but I don't, but Bob can probably speak more to. And I appreciate that, Kevin. And I. The Police Bureau does an amazing job with community outreach, community engagement. I know that may ring hollow for some people, but um, I can, you know, really point to to countless community meetings and, you know, efforts and coffee with a cop, et cetera, et cetera. But I think where we miss the mark is really uh, developing the deeper relationships and developing the opportunity to have the conversations that Kevin and I have been able to have. Kevin and Leslie are some of the few people I've met on this topic where, you know, I'll be in an event, he'll say something that I don't like, doesn't resonate with me, I don't agree with it, whatever, and I'll sit down and say, hey, I don't like the way you said this. And you know what his response is? Tell me more about that. <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not about an argument. And even at the end of the conversation, we may just agree that that's probably not a place where we're going to land at the same time. But we're richer for it. And I'm better, and I've learned, and I resonate, and I think about it. And so much of you know, the conversations that the, we have with the community are either in the context of a, you know, a stop or a victim or something to that effect, which doesn't lend itself to a lot of really positive interaction all the time, or it's in these, you know, uh, environments where, uh, you know, there's not the, the ability for either side to really let their guard down and have that conversation and have that honest discussion and walk out of the room and realize, okay, you know, we didn't move a foot, we moved an inch, but I'm good with an inch. And why don't we come back in two weeks and sit down and see if we can't move another inch, you know? And that, that's what I'm about. It's all about listening, right? Uh, so let's take another question, 30 second or less, city, from a city club member. Hi, I'm Charles Aragi, city club member. Um, uh, we, we're talking more about interactions and, and police stops uh, community, but I wonder if you would have uh, any thoughts on a related subject, which is criminal justice reform. There was some seeming um, coming together of liberal and conservative views maybe a few years back, and it seems to have faded out. Any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, absolutely the system doesn't work. I mean, and I'm part of the system, right? And once again, as I said at the beginning, I'm proud of the work that I have done. I'm proud of the work that men and women are doing every day um, in the police bureau. But in reality, 
um, the, you know, the model that we've used for many, many years has to change. And, you know, the model from the policing standpoint was you do something wrong, you get arrested, you go to jail. It's not our problem after that. And I think, um, you know, we're the tip of the spear on the criminal justice system. Everything starts with us. And um, I think sometimes we fail to recognize that responsibility, that when we make that decision um, to take that enforcement action, we're starting the entire thing rolling. If that doesn't happen, then nothing happens downstream, with the courts, with the prisons, whatever it might be. So really training and preparing our officers to view things differently, you know, and to understand, um, you know, it's, it's difficult because, you know, it is a culture of right and wrong. It seems pretty simple, it seems pretty clear to us. Um, but, you know, if we can help prepare our officers to understand, you know, their power of discretion, their authority, their influence, um, partner with organizations, which we do uh, a lot of, that provide alternatives to enforcement, I think that's really a key. And a lot of the changes that are occurring in the justice system, which I'm supportive of, you know, we're, you know, reducing prisons and, you know, things like that, or early release, things of that nature, I'm not opposed to, but, um, you know, that's all downstream stuff. And really, I think where, you know, some of the reform and the effort needs to happen is on the front end with the police themselves. But it's a, such a difficult line because on the same time as we're talking about this, we still live in a society that does have a high degree of violence, where we do have officers that are killed and assaulted, and where, you know, officers valiantly run to the gunfire every day, put themselves in harm's way, take risks on behalf of that system that we're trying to protect. So on one hand, we're asking him, you know, this uh, guardian mentality that's prevalent right now in 21st century policing, but there's times when they have to step up with that warrior mentality. So yes, the system does need to be reformed. I think the effort needs to be put um, towards police by giving them tools and options other than enforcement. That then will impact the whole system overall. Well, let's take uh, possibly our last question. Okay, it's our last question, and please identify yourself. Okay, thank you. I'm Alice Shapiro, and I am a City Club member. So this question is for Captain Day, and you've kind of, kind of skirted around your reasoning, but as an educator who has trained health professionals, for example, they don't get to choose the curriculum they want to attend. So I'm wondering why this training that's being offered by Mr. Jones is not mandatory. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the benefit of working in a paramilitary organization is we can tell people what to do and they have to do it. So uh, that certainly is an option for us, but um, my personal belief, and this is personal, this isn't a, I'm not speaking on behalf of the police bureau here, is that um, I don't wanna contribute any more to the harm or the ignorance. And quite frankly, when you tell a bunch of white guys, which is what the police bureau is largely made up of, that you have to go and sit and listen to this conversation or listen to this play, which I know, as I said, even as somebody who's on this journey has a hard time digesting, I know what the conversation is going to be when they walk out of there. And I feel like I have contributed and I haven't really equipped them. Now, we intend to do this play again. And people that were there, I know will invite other people that were there, you know, and that's how you start a movement, right? You don't need to get all 948 of us on board. You know, you get 10, 15, 20 percent that are engaging, and that's how you begin to affect change. So I want people who can handle it, can manage it, and I'm having those relationships. You know, somebody mentioned about African-American officers being involved. Once again, I'm not proud of this fact, but after the Hands Up performance, and we had half a dozen or so, I went back and met with all of them individually. Changed my life, changed my perspective. These people have been in the organization for a number of years, I've never had conversations with them. And, you know, so I'm learning even basic, simple, fundamental, relationship skills that I thought I had pretty well mastered after three decades. So, you know, ordering people to come, and we will order people to come to implicit bias training next year, that will happen, but I think this is a bigger pill to swallow, quite frankly. Yeah, and, and I, I just wanna say that, you know, I've been involved in diversity training and workshops and conflict resolution for over 25 years, and I've done a lot of training, and this work does not work when you make people come. It just doesn't. And um, if you try to do that, and I know it's being done now that people are, the officers are being made to come, it, you just stretch it out. You just lengthen the amount of time it takes for that person to get there. It's really about the relationship. I believe that. And even though it's harder work and it's slower work, it's really about people 
knowing how to connect with other people and how to be curious and how to engage. And if you don't know how to do that, the words, the training, and all that stuff, it's, it, it, just, it, it only works for the people who are, who are ready anyway. They're already looking for information. They're already buying the books and watching the workshops. And, but for the person who is closed, making them come to a workshop to, to about anything that, that's supposed to teach them something that they don't want to do, I think is a mistake. And I, and I yeah, I think it's a big mistake. So. Well, thank you, Kevin, and yep. thank you, Bob. It does look something like the start of a movement, doesn't it? I'm very sorry to say that we are out of broadcast time and we'll have to stop for the day. I can't, but you can. Oh, good. So I was, I'm, I have my booking manager and other people with hands up here, and I would be really remiss if I did not say to you guys, we're doing hands up at Wyden Kennedy tomorrow at 7 o'clock, 7.30, sorry, and again on Sunday at 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock? Just fire me. So please, come. If you haven't seen the show, please tell folks. Um, uh, we've got plenty of seats, and we'd love it if you came. And, and if this program has inspired you to join or contribute to the City Club, you can still do so at the registration table as you leave. This is Leslie Johnson from City Club's Board of Governors. Thank you to our guests. Thank you to Melissa Magana, today's Friday Forum producer of the committee's program. This program is adjourned. <laughs>